I want a sentence. And I'm going, I've had little words, you know, and everything. So I couldn't sleep Friday night, couldn't sleep Saturday night. Sunday night, I laid down and I don't remember anything until I woke up the next morning. And when I walked in at the thing, my cousin took me to the school and she said, do you have a sentence for you, for me? What's your sentence? God wasn't done with me yet. Perfect sentence. She says, who's God? I don't know. I have no memory of anything. I didn't have any memory of my life prior to that. She said, Every now and then you come up with something you remember and I sort of <laughs> it's a subconscious though. Yeah. Well, it's like they took me down to one of the offices and said they told me my computer's at home. I don't know what I thought. I didn't know my husband, my father, nobody. It's time. Anyway, they took me. If you're all live stream, you're probably right on, you need to be right on schedule. Here we go. Good morning. Good morning, and welcome to Emmanuel United Methodist Church. I'm Terry Zieber, your liturgist for today. Sunday school will continue after worship today. We will have a reception on Sunday, July 7th, to welcome Pastor Haley and her family, and we hope you will all plan to be there. Please consider volunteering for Day for Hope on August 3rd. We need your support and help. The orientation meeting is July 20th, is July 10th at 6 p.m. or Saturday, July 20th at 9 a.m. You can sign up in the Nothex for the time that is best for you. Today's guest speaker is Reverend John Fulgrod from Trinity UMC, who will bring us the message this morning. The guest violinist is Sherry Mattis. Let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship as Karen plays the prelude. Let us pray. When sorrow and hardship abound and events across a notion and down the block shake our resolve and make us question what good the good news is even doing, 
God calls us, open your heart. When fear and misinformation infiltrate our relationships and we don't know who to trust or how to do the next right thing, God calls to us, open your heart. When joy overflows and we witness the fruit of grace all around us, transforming our lives and our communities into places of connection and flourishing, God calls to us, open your heart. May this time of worship be, for each of us, a time to listen to God's call, to open our hearts and accept the divine invitation to say yes to the work of grace in us, among us, and all around us. God, we open our hearts to receive your gift of grace, knowing you hold us securely in the palm of your hands, that we might have the courage to live in vulnerable community with you and one another. Amen. Um, please rise as you are able for the opening hymn, From All That Dwell Below the Skies, number 101. Affirmation of faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated.
Pastor, will you do the, the uh, pastoral prayer? I was looking ahead in the bulletin. Let us join together in the spirit of prayer. Lord, as we gather this morning, some of us have come because it's the thing we do. Some of us have come with a sense of curiosity. Some of us have come and, well, if we were really downright honest with ourselves and you, we'd say we're not sure, but we're here. Whatever the reason, some of us may have come with broken hearts. Some of us may have come with situations that we're facing that are just simply bigger than we are. No matter what it is, reach out and touch each and every one of us with your grace. Let your spirit so fill our lives that we know your presence and your power and that we will take that presence and power and trust that it goes with us as we leave this place later today. Use us, each and every one of us, in some way today to, to make an impact on someone else's life, to be a source of forgiveness, perhaps, a source of hope, a source of encouragement, a source of new life. Use each and every one of us in the way that you know is best for us and those around us. We pray for our world that is so filled with violence, with hatred, with the stench of death and suffering that is not of your hand but ours. We ask forgiveness. And we ask that you will use us as peacemakers, as followers of the Prince of Peace, in whatever way that may be, whether it is as near as our homes or as far away as a distant land in a distant country. Let us be faithful in our following of Jesus the Christ, our risen Lord, and as we join together with disciples across the centuries, we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
There are four ways to give at Emmanuel. Online, through our website, in the offering boxes at each entrance and exit, by mail, or by dropping off your offering at the church office. We appreciate your generosity to help Emmanuel continue our work in our community and beyond. Please bow your heads in prayer. Gracious God, as we bring our offerings before you in this Pentecost season, we acknowledge the gift of your grace, freely given and yet calling us to respond. Help us not to accept your grace in vain, but to let it bear fruit in our lives and in our communities. May our actions reflect the transforming power of your grace as we open our hearts to love, to vulnerability, and to relationship, trusting in the abundance of your grace to guide us. Amen. Please stand as you are able for the doxology and the hymn, Seek Ye First. Please be seated. I had said I was, earlier I was looking ahead in the bulletin and now perhaps you know why. It's been my pleasure to hear Sherry play on other occasions, so I was anxiously going to that moment. And uh, it happens sometimes. I want to, to share with you our scripture lesson this morning. It comes from the concluding chapter of the Sermon on the Mount. I invite you to listen. Ask, and you will receive. Search, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. Whoever seeks, finds. And to everyone who knocks, the door is opened. Who among you will give your children a stone when they ask for bread? Or give them a snake when they ask for a fish? If you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give good things to those who ask him? Therefore, you should treat the people in the same way that you want to be treated. This is the law and the prophets. I really didn't want to do that.
when I was in basic training for the Air Force. As the six weeks drew closer to an end, we were all being evaluated on a variety of things. We had to meet physical fitness goals. We had to pass a, a written test on certain things with regard to drill. And we had to perform what's called the 54-step drill movement, leading our flight in, in all 54 steps. And it was my turn to do that, and I had in my mind the 54 steps, and I had not only the command that I was supposed to give now, but I had several down the road that I was thinking of as well, all at the same time. And when you're giving commands in drill, it's, it's not the most complex process in the world. You give the command on the foot of the direction you want to go. So if you want to go to the left, you give the commands on the left foot. If you want to go to the right, you give the commands on the right foot. Now that's not rocket science, is it? <laughs> I was going through and I was about a third of the way through the 54 step movement and I was sinking two steps ahead. And the next command that was coming up was by the left flank, which means you'd give the commands on the left foot. Then there was another command by the right flank. In my mind, I gave the command by the left flank, but I did it on the right foot. <laughs> and muscle memory took over, and I just went to the right. And then have you ever had a situation where it, it dawns on you that, that something may be out of sorts? You, you just get this feeling that, that not all is the way it's supposed to be. I had that about six steps into going off in the wrong direction. And I decided to turn around just to make sure the flight was coming so I could give the next command and I will forever forever remember the scene in my mind's eye. About three quarters of the flight was following me. And there were two guys that were going the other direction and they were marking time, which means they were marching in place in front of a car. And there were two more that were walking into a field and just going like gangbusters. And then there were three or four that weren't sure what in the world was going on, and so they were turning back and forth. And as I surveyed this issue with people coming at me and people going away from me, I had absolutely no idea what to do. And so I said the first thing that, that came to my mind, everybody stop! <laughs> that isn't in the drill manual, by the way. And I didn't have the slightest idea how to get everybody back together, so I just said, get back here. <laughs> the Air Force has a sense of humor because I was stationed at Lackland Air Force Base for four years in the basic military training program, where drill is a part of that, and I would do one or two or three parades a week and I would often supervise drill activities out on the drill pad. But I learned a very important lesson that day in Biloxi, Mississippi in basic training, and it's this. A lot more people look at what you do than what you say. People look at more at what you do than what you say. Now, I just didn't come up with that bit of wisdom. As a matter of fact, Jesus taught on it, and it's part of our scripture lesson this morning. Treat others the way you would have them treat you. If you read carefully through the Gospels, you will see that Jesus is emphasizing more often than not how we behave. Certainly the 25th chapter 
of Matthew's gospel is all about how we behave. And it's the same in the last part of, of the Sermon on the Mount. The other parts of the Sermon on the Mount as well are, are around how we behave. He wants us to know that what matters is how we treat one another. Now, some people terribly misunderstand the first part of what I read this morning, and they think that's about prayer. It's not. It's about how we act to one another in community. All of the Sermon on the Mount is about how we act in community with one another. And so it just sets up this treat one another as you would have them treat you. And that's kind of the interpretive key to the whole last part of the Sermon on the Mount in chapter 7 of Matthew's Gospel. How we treat others is important. And if there's any lack of understanding about that, Jesus clarifies it. And he says something he only says a few other times. All of the law and the prophets rest on this. How we treat others makes a difference. And in fact, it is the faithful carrying out of all of the law of the prophets and prophets. If you want a summary of the Old Testament, Jesus is saying, how you treat one another is indicative of that. Sadly, most people haven't really read the Old Testament in depth, but it's right. He also uses that, this is while the law and the prophets, when he talks about love the Lord your God with all your heart and mind and soul and strength and your neighbor as yourself. Those two places, he interjects his phrase because it's so important. How we treat one another is absolutely essential and critical and foundational to following Christ. And when we begin to treat one another the way we'd like to be treated, we begin to understand ourselves differently. We begin to understand ourselves differently. My stepfather, Mel, was a, a wonderful psychiatrist. He, he taught forensic psychiatry at Temple University in Philadelphia. He had a thriving psychiatry practice for, for kids and, and adolescents and, and adults. And then in his early 50s, he started to go deaf. And over a span of about six or eight years, he went from sort of deaf to completely deaf. And he decided to write a letter to all his patients saying, I, I need to release you as patients because I'm now deaf. And a bunch took him at his word and found other psychiatrists that he referred them to. But some stayed with him and said, no, 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 you're our doctor, we're going to stay with you. And he didn't know what to do, so he, he said, okay. And he said to me, as I said that, I was wondering my, to myself, and my stepfather had a wonderful sense of humor, he said, what good in the world is a deaf shrink? But an amazing thing happened. He discovered that his patients that were still seeing him started to make some incredible improvements and growth and healing was taking place. 
And as he was thinking about that, he said, you know what the key was? They were more honest with me than they had ever been because they didn't think I could hear them. <laughs> and then he said with a wonderful smile, but they didn't know I could read lips. <laughs> But he began to understand himself differently. Why? Because he was treating those people as he would have wanted to be treated, as, as somebody who cared and who didn't let an obstacle get in the way. And I, I just want to say this, too. This isn't part of the sermon, but it is. There's no such thing as handicapped people. There are no handicapped people in this world. There are people with handicapping conditions, but there are no handicapped people. And he had a handicapping condition, but he didn't let it stop him. And he discovered as he treated other people like he wanted to be treated, he understood himself in a whole new way. And he was, by his own admission, I was a better psychiatrist when I was deaf than when I could hear. When we treat other people the way we'd like to be treated, we begin to see and understand ourselves in a different way. I went to a, a church back in Ohio, that's my home conference, East Ohio, and I was in my first Sunday at a church and, and we did children's sermons, which I loved. I would ask kids to bring something up and, and I'd pick something and tell them what, how it reminded me of God. So it was this wonderful experience and I was sitting down the first Sunday in this church and 40 or 50 kids came up. And one little boy kind of worked his way through. If you can imagine how kids are kind of working their way through a group, he kind of worked his way through, and he sat on my lap. I was sitting down, like, just like here on the, on the stage, sitting down with, with kids all around, and he got up and sat on my leg, and I put my arm around him, and he kind of snuggled in, and as I was sharing with the kids what I was going to ask them to do in the coming weeks, he, he was talking a mile a minute. And I couldn't understand a single word he was saying. And so when the service was over, I went to the Christian education director and I said, can you tell me a little bit about this young boy, Michael? She said, well, first of all, his name's Mikhail. Oh, I said, does he have a terrible speech impediment or something? And she said, no. He came over from Russia two weeks ago and was adopted by one of the people in the congregation, and he was speaking Russian <laughs> the whole time. Well, from that first Sunday on, he and I became like this. And he had a place on my lap for about two years until he finally made the adjustment of being in a new country and knowing that he could trust people. But I learned a lot more about myself with him sitting on my lap every week than I had ever learned teaching kids different things that reminded me of God. When we treat others the way we would like to be treated, and I, it wasn't quite me that I saw my leg, but I saw one of my sons as a young two-year-old sitting on my leg. We begin to understand ourselves differently. When we treat one another the way we would like to be treated, when we take up that command to treat others the way we would like to be treated. And by the way, it is a command, not a suggestion. We begin to see others 
differently. We had just been appointed to a church in Stowe, Ohio, and it was an exciting church that I loved being there for, for eight plus years. And our first Sunday there, as, as folks were coming out of the church, somebody came up and introduced themselves to me and said, I'm Dr. Joe Schmo. That obviously wasn't his name, but I'm not going to share it with you. And he said, I, I'd love to, to sit down and talk with you sometime. I said, I'll give you a call. We'll find some time this week that we can get together. He said, that'd be great. And so when I went down and, and met with him, went to his, his condo and sat and talked with him for a while, I said, by the way, what attracted you to the church? And he said, well, it, it didn't hurt that the congregation gave everybody who was a new visitor an apple pie <laughs> that afternoon. I said, I, I'm sure you're right. But as we began to talk, he began to share a past that was filled with shameful things and painful things that had led to his losing his medical license for three years. And I simply listened. Because I understood if you want to treat people the way you'd like to be treated many times, that means just listening to somebody, not trying to fix them, not trying to correct them, not trying to point out their shortcomings. They already know that. He certainly did. And when the time of our visit came to a close, I said, would you like me to pray with you? And he said, oh, yes. And in the course of our visit, he had shared how his mom was a hypercritical mother and she had been chopping him off at the knees for all his mistakes. And part of my prayer was simply that he would know the forgiving, healing love of God in Jesus Christ. And when that prayer was over, I saw a different person sitting in front of me than when I started. And he said, you know what happened? He said, I had a vision of Christ forgiving me as you were praying. Now, please don't make any false assumptions that somehow because I was a pastor praying, that made that vision take place. That's not the reason. The reason was, if anything, that I saw him not as a person who is all a mess, but I treated him the way I would want to be treated if I was dealing with my life in a shambles. And Christ did incredible things in those moments. That's just the way it works we begin to see other people differently. I was asked one day if I would take somebody to the Cleveland Clinic to, to get their cataract surgery done. Their ride had evaporated and they were desperate. And Helen was somebody who worked in the church office and I wasn't exactly super excited to do this, but on the other hand, I appreciated all she had done in the life of the church, and so I said, sure, I'll take you. And we went to the clinic, and I took a book to read while we were there, and she had her cataract surgery, and then we started to head home. And it was the most amazing trip that I've ever experienced in a car. Because shortly after we got down out of downtown Cleveland 
and into the more open area, she started going, Wow! Would you look at that? I'd look. I didn't know why she was going, Wow! She said, Do you see how green the leaves are on the trees? And then we'd come by some tulips because it was late April. And she said, oh my, look at that. Look at how colorful those tulips are. And the whole trip, 45 minutes in the car back, was one exclamation after another as she was seeing the world differently than she had in quite some time. And I thought to myself, I was simply treating her as I would like to be treated. And if truth be told, my motivation wasn't all that great. I was doing it because she was desperate. But I never saw Helen again without thinking of that trip back. How she had been given new life through her eyes and, and Dr. Joe had been given new life through a healing in his spirit. When we treat one another as we would like to be treated, we begin to experience others differently. And the last thing I want to say is when we begin treating one another as we would like to be treated, we discover Christ is present in all kinds of places and situations. You know the famous stories, no doubt, of Mother Teresa looking into the eyes of a dying uh, person in the slums of Calcutta and seeing the face of Christ. That is the epitome of that. But it happens in so many different ways. I'm reminded of, of the story of, a, of an executive who went to work one day and one of his junior executives knocked on the door and, and said, may I come in and talk with you for a few minutes? And he said, sure. And as the young executive came in and closed the door, he, he said, I, I want you to know that in my Sunday school class, we've been asked to think about somebody who's made an impact in our lives, and we want to share our appreciation. And in order to do that, we've each been given three You Are My Hero badges to share with people. And he said, I've shared two others. And I, I was thinking, who will I share this the third with? He said, and you came to mind. And he said, I want to thank you for all the ways you, you have and are mentoring me, for, for the way you've shown me the ropes, for the way you've overlooked some of my mistakes and helped me learn from them rather than casting me to the side. And he said, I'm a better person, I'm a better employee, I'm just better all the way around because you have been a part of my life. And he said, I'd like to give this to you, and, and I do so with one request. And that is, you will find somebody to give it to. So for the rest of the day that that executive was thinking, who am I going to give this you are my number one hero badge to? And then toward the end of the day it hit him. I'm going to share it with my son. So when he got home, he, he invited his son to come and sit down with him and said, you know, sometimes it can seem like I'm a little gruff or or critical, he said, and, and perhaps most of the time that's not warranted, and I apologize for that and ask you to forgive me for that. But he said, what I feel deep in my heart 
is how blessed I am, how fortunate I am to have you as a son. How proud I am of you. And he said, I don't say that nearly enough, but I want to say it clearly today, and I promise you I'm going to say it more and more and more as the future comes. He said, but in the meantime, I'd like to share this with you. And he shared that you are my number one hero badge with him. And he said, I'd like you to have this. And whenever you look at it, I'd like you to remember just what a gift you are and how incredibly proud I am of you and thankful I am that you are my son. And he wasn't quite prepared for the reaction of, of the young man. He just started to burst into uncontrollable sobs. For several minutes, he couldn't talk. He just was sobbing uncontrollably. Unfortunately, the dad was smart enough to just be quiet. And then the son said, Dad, I brought all my books home from school today. I cleaned out my locker and he started to sob again. And then finally he got control of himself and said, I was planning to take my own life tonight. I didn't think I amounted to anything to anybody. But Dad, you've shown me that I have a reason to live that I am important, that I am significant. And he got up and he gave his dad a big, long hug, and his dad returned it. And there were multiple I love yous that went back and forth. When we begin to treat other people the way we'd like to be treated, it's amazing how Jesus Christ pops up in all kinds of situations in life. From the most mundane to the incredible. To ones that take our breath away. To ones that leave us scratching perhaps our heads. But the redeeming power and love of Christ is present. And we begin to notice that. Not that we cause it. But we begin to recognize it. And the more we recognize it, the more we can share it. And the more empowered we become to treat one another as we would like to be treated. I close with this. Adam Hamilton shared a quote with his congregation, and it goes something like this. The number one reason people are atheists in our society is that people who call themselves followers of Christ or churchgoers profess something with their lips when they're inside the church, but they do something else with their lives when they're outside it. Sadly, that is true, and clearly that is damning. But I want to share with you the good news is 
when we are taking seriously Christ's command to treat one another as we would like to be treated, we become part of the solution rather than part of the problem. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Reverend John, for that blessing us with that wonderful message. Um, let's stand for our final hymn, Be Thou My Vision. Now let us go forth in the joy and the power of the risen Christ, treating one another as we would like to be treated, so be it, and amen. amen.